start our meeting now, and um, Brian is going to introduce the speaker to Borua, who's talking about plastic pollution. Right. Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Very pleasure to welcome Drew to our meeting today. Um, I've been trying to find out a little bit about him while we've been sitting here talking. He's, he's a bit of a soldier of fortune, actually, it seems to me. He's, um, he's devoted his life at the moment to this question of pollution, and plastic pollution in particular. And uh, he's given up work, he's committed himself to it, obviously a man of uh, means. So um, I'll be very interested in what you have to say about you. You're incredibly welcome. Give it to you. So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, my experiences with plastic over the last uh, two years now. And we're working 100% on, on, the, on the cause. Uh, so, plastic is actually uh, a fantastic material. In fact, uh, plastic saved my life. Yeah. Not the best way to, to start an adventure, especially when I was getting the license uh, for the bike, uh, or the water bike, uh, to ride on, on the Thames. But you can see that I'm grabbing hold on to my plastic clothes and my plastic buoyancy that actually saved my life. On one hand, we cannot keep ourselves away from plastic, but on the other hand, these are the headlines of today. The ocean's deadliest predator. So plastic is so cheap, so moldable, so flexible, so convenient, and so strong that plastic, that this, this, this plastic ring can not only kill this duck, but it can go and kill many more ducks because once the body decomposes, the ring is free for its next kill. And we are hearing news about uh, you know marine life dying in the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean. In some remote island, birds are dying. We've seen pictures of birds stuck in the uh, plastic bags. We don't have to look so far. This duck is actually from Birmingham, where they found it. They tried to rescue the duck, but the duck was quite strong and was running around. So they couldn't, they couldn't uh, uh, get hold of her, and then never to be seen again. So um, you know, I, I don't think there will be a lot of good news here. But here, that's why I'm not here to talk about uh, all the bad things happening in the ocean. Let me show you some things happening here, you know, in, uh, in England. So this is me in uh, stroke on Trent uh, on my paddleboard. And you can see the amount of uh, plastic litter from the waterways here uh, in the country. So, uh, yeah, so the marine life in the ocean is dying, but uh, where is it starting? It's, it starts here with us in the canals, the rivers, and then to the ocean. That's the stroke. This is in London, uh, Little Venice. You will see the duck now trying to eat styrofoam. It's right here, so we don't have to go and uh, you know go to remote corners of the planet to to see the real effect of plastic pollution. And this is here. I saw it uh, two weeks ago in the Little Venice area again. Uh, the duck now is trying to you know find food, I believe, but then you know it can get entangled with the plastic bag and, and it's, it's good. So there's no one to to help her out. So you can see this is this is in Little Venice area. So all of this is actually happening. And, and, and these are the reasons why. So people are using uh, the waterways. So yeah, so we have seen a few videos where people are actually throwing uh, rubbish uh, for various reasons on the canal. This is actually from Maribon, uh, not far away. Like it's in central London. So we don't even have to go far away to see this kind of um, behavior. Actually, people are throwing stuff on me as well, uh, you know, while I was doing a project. We'll come to that uh, later. So yeah, so the question here is now, uh, you know, wh why, why plastic keeps me awake in the night or wh why plastic uh, wakes me up in the morning apart from my uh, plastic alarm clock. <laughs> so a few years ago, uh, in a crazy moment, um, I decided to uh, join a race team to race a 70 foot yacht from London to Rio de Janeiro. So it was the clipper around the world race. And, um, and it, uh, so we, uh, it was a great incentive for me to learn how to swim, first thing. <laughs> and in the middle of the ocean, uh, it was a great experience. Uh, uh, I, uh, we were, I was there helming, I could see uh, the stars, the sky full of stars. I could feel the, the wave uh, on the boat, the, the wind on the sails, and you know, I could see the phosphorus behind the boat. 
and thousands of dolphins around uh, around uh, jumping, not just like one, two, ten, like thousands of them. It's really, really magical. And during the daytime, you can see the whole ocean in front of you. Uh, you have flying fish, you know, they come and hit you, and then you realize how far from land you are. It's a great experience to be so out with Mother Nature uh, until you encounter these kind of scenarios. <laughs> So this is one of the lucky scenarios where one of our other teams could go and rescue these turtles stuck with fishing nets and, uh, and plastic bottles. And that is when, you know, we all realized, I saw a lot of other plastic as well, uh, that's when uh, we all realized the scale of the problem, how it has gone so far in the, in the middle of the ocean. You just, you just don't expect uh, things to be, you know, just floating around. Uh, they have been seeing like toilet seat covers and stuff like that in the middle of the ocean like last uh, few months ago in the in the North Pacific. But then again, so I was back in London after the race, and I thought we need to do something about it. I saw a lot of plastic uh, on the on the foreshore uh, of the Thames and the canals, and I wanted to do more and uh, to raise awareness about plastic um, in the in the country. Uh, but I had to come up with a with a backing campaign. Because if I did uh, something similar, something where people usually expect things to happen, so for example on a paddle board or on a canoe, uh, it may not have that kind, kind of uh, impact in terms of engaging people, you know, educating them and then inspiring them to take action. So I thought, let me try to do something different. Uh, let me, uh, I always wanted to cycle on the river. So let me cycle on the river. So I had a, made a bamboo bike a few years ago uh, to cycle around Colombia. So I let me get my bamboo bike, uh, put a float on the left, a float on the right, a propeller rather in the front, uh, two fishing nets behind, and that was it. So I went to Lechile and uh, we started the journey uh, uh, on the Thames. So that's my bike. Uh, so this bike is my road bike, so I use it every day. I didn't cycle to it, it's raining, but same bike. So this bike has been an amazing conversation starter. This campaign has been a great success because everyone stopped and they asked, so what the hell are you doing? Is this your road bike? You can't escape some cyclists, not even on the river. Uh, and it was a great uh, conversation starter, so I could talk to them about the dangers of plastic because people could see all the plastic in the fishing nets behind me and I could tell them how the plastic is reaching, leaking from the river, from the canal, and then going to the ocean and how it's breaking down into microplastics and things like that. It was a great tool. It was a great tool to engage with people, uh, educate people, and then inspire people to uh, take some action. This was last year in, uh, this is not, no, but I, I started this last year in September uh, on the whole Thames. I cycled the uh, whole night of the Thames. Uh, and then now I'm doing on the other uh, waterways in, the, in England, then in Holland, and now uh, maybe in New York as well uh, in the next month uh, on the Hudson River. Uh, so this has been a powerful tool uh, uh, to talk to people, so, uh, so now, the thing was that all of this I was collecting so far is the, is the visible plastic. The plastic that we can actually see. Uh, the plastic bottles, styrofoam containers, plastic straws. Uh, but this may not be the biggest problem. It is just microplastics that is actually causing a much bigger uh, concern as of now. This small bits of plastics. So, how, how, how can microplastics uh, you know, occur, for example? There are three ways. One of them is in the, in the, in the, in the ocean. The big plastic uh, bottles, uh, uh, fishing nets, containers, and stuff, they break down because of the ultraviolet rays, the waves, and the wind, to small, smaller and smaller pieces. Uh, one thing to know is that as an, uh, the more smaller it gets, the surface area of the plastic becomes bigger and bigger, and I'll come to that uh, later on. The other one is actually we make microplastics. We make them uh, what they're called nurdles, so small plastic pellets. We, we use them to make other plastic products. And they used to be locked in the cosmetics and other products, but now they're banned, but obviously they're also being used in other uh, scenarios. And the third one is uh, due to uh, wear and tear, uh, because, uh, you know, well, say for example, we're using our cars, uh, the tires want to uh, leak a lot of microplastics into that environment. Uh, Every time we, um, uh, we wash our outdoor clothing, uh, it can release up to one million microscopic fibers into the water system. Good God. And then from the water system, it comes straight back to, the, to us. So uh, recent reports have shown uh, that in Europe, 83% of tap water 
contains uh, micro microscopic plastic particles, uh, and uh, also in bottled water as well. Uh, so now, plastic now, so there, there's an estimate uh, um, by UN that there are around 51 trillion uh, microscopic particles around around the world uh, in the in the waterways, just hanging around. Uh, yeah. So, so now plastic now is uh, you know plastic uh, now is in the water we drink, the the salt, the honey you know, uh, and then we eat, and then uh, it's also in the air we breathe. It's basically uh, you know in the food we eat. It's basically everywhere. So these days when I try you know, when I go for dinner, I wonder if I'll be having the strands of someone else's underwear. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I didn't believe this, but obviously uh, uh, I did not have the budget to go and hire those expensive lab equipment to go and analyze for myself if there is plastic in the water or around the environment. So I went to Amazon, I got my own microscope for 18 pounds, and this is what you see, uh, some microscopic uh, fibers uh, from, from the environment. So uh, it's, it's a good, it's, it's like 18 pounds, but good resolution as well. Uh, it's, it's quite cheap, quite simple. Uh, just to show people that anyone can actually do it if they have uh, the time. So now, so I was discovering stuff as I was going through my journey uh, around uh, plastics and things like that. But then, um, you know, while I was talking about plastics, microplastics, uh, I realized uh, that this was just one side of the picture. I was actually missing the, the, the other side. And that is what I think I'm going to share with you today, what I've learned around the, about the other side. So firstly, uh, the plastic, uh, it, con um, it contains additives called BPA and, and pithylates. So those additives are added to plastic to make it stronger, to make it flexible, to give it color and things like that. And plastic can actually uh, leak all these chemicals to the environment. So that's firstly, first thing. And the second thing is that once the plastic is in the environment, the microplastics, they act like magnets as well and they attract those chemicals from the environment. And uh, so we have uh, not only those BP and patholates, but also pesticides and everything else and metals around the environment. And they become dangerous cocktails. So they attract and they become dangerous cocktails of all these chemicals. And we don't know basically uh, what, 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 what's going to happen. Uh, so we all know uh, that BP and patholates on their own, there are many doctors, I'm not a doctor, but there are BP and patholates on their own are endocrine disruptors. That means they can go and disrupt the hormone system of the body. Uh, and we all know that BP, because of, uh, sorry, fish exposed to BPA have developed intersex characteristics. And they're responsible for heart disease, you know, uh, reduced um, uh, uh, fertility in men, harm to reproductive growth in boys, and things like that. These chemicals on their, on their own. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, and, and the microplastics are attracting them. And then in the medical science, these plastics, uh, the bioplastics are being used to do drug delivery into the body. And if that is happening, what stops from this, uh, you know, waste uh, plastic, uh, microplastic, to do the same thing? Uh, but because you're getting exposed to it or uh, whatnot. So, that is, I think, the real danger when uh, all these toxic chemicals are actually going around the body. Again, you know, I'm, I'm, gonna make some, I'm making some bold statements. I'm not a doctor, but I have read a lot of papers. Uh, the number of uh, children born that do not know if they're a boy or a girl can be directly relate, linked to these endocrine disrupting chemicals, especially the BP and patholates that are present in every plastic, most of the plastic uh, you know, items we have today. So, that is where the uh, it's a growing danger. But again, uh, so you may be thinking, how does it affect me? These are too small, it's going to disappear anyway. So uh, the thing here is, you know, all this microplastics in the environment will be eaten by these beautiful uh, uh, zooplanktons. Uh, and, and once they eat them, they're like the, the largest animal mass in the planet. And it's going to come up the food chain, uh, you know, by the small, say, uh, small uh, like big fish, and it comes to the final consumer with us on the dinner plate. So you shouldn't be surprised when you see everything coming up here, concentrated. I'm going to show you a few videos now. Um, so that's a highly uh, magnified view of uh, phytoplanktons uh, with plastic particles. So uh, they, 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 they quickly go around it, the chemicals around it. And then the other one is also uh, a small microfiber, really, really highly magnified. Uh, but you can see all the phytoplanktons and they're all getting entangled. They get entangled and it becomes a very dangerous cocktail that will be eaten by uh, you know, the big fish and on its journey to our uh, dinner plate. 
So if we continue this way, uh, in the next uh, 30 years, uh, this is what we may read. Our ocean will be dead. We may be thinking, you know, uh, um, should we have banned plastic or, or things like that. But again, plastic is a fantastic material. Oh, let me highlight on that. But again, do we want to read this kind of newspaper in 2030? Uh, or I, I do not want to read this kind of news. So uh, I've given a lot of bad news now. Uh, because, but, it's the, but the good thing here is that, you know, um, you may go and Google about it now, learn more about it, and talk about it to friends and family, and then uh, try to take some uh, concrete steps. But then again, we also need to find solutions. Uh, so the whole uh, market now, or the whole industry, is full of startups and disruptive ideas that are trying to uh, disrupt the, the way the plastics economy works. The only way uh, to uh, get out of uh, this uh, or to prevent plastic in our, from the entering our food, air, and water is to uh, innovate, is to rethink everything, rethink design, uh, rethink uh, manufacturing, rethink uh, consumption, and rethink disposal. I'm going to give you a few uh, of those disruptive ideas in the market. So this is a company called uh, Miwa. So you can order your food using, using your app. And then you can buy, uh, you can pick up the, your food in, in your own container or in uh, reusable containers in the shop. So this is based in uh, in, uh, in in Prague. Uh, this is interesting. Cup Club, uh, based in London. So why do you want to own a cup or packaging? Why can't we rent it? Just like Uber, you know, Uber with, with cars. So trying to disrupt the packaging industry, packaging for rent. You don't need to buy them, and they're also going to collect and recycle it for you as well. And then this another one is very exciting. Because uh, like most of the accidental discoveries, they have discovered this uh, uh, enzyme called PTAs uh, in, the, in the University of Plymouth. And it can actually eat plastic in a matter of days, uh, not years. So this looks to be very, very uh, promising and can change recycling. This is very exciting, but we also need to be careful that if it's eating the plastic, is it breaking down into microplastics or nanoplastics? We don't know yet. And this is not in the production. They're just working on it. But there's a lot of good things happening. Again, so the water bottle. Why does a water bottle need to look like a water bottle? Because someone decided it needs to look like this many, many years ago. And these guys from Imperial College are rethinking packaging. So they're making this small bubble made out of seaweed. It's edible. So you can actually eat the, eat the, eat the, eat the, eat the, eat the layer as well and drink the, drink the water. So they're trying this out now in, the, in a few marathons, because you know the marathons and the sports where you have a lot of bottles, people are chucking away. So they're trying it out, people can just have one of those and, and run. And they're also using this to replace uh, a small sachets of tomato ketchup and things like that. So this can be quite revolutionary. So it's a rethinking design. So uh, one more thing, uh, uh, it's not here, is uh, it's a company called Splosh. Uh, again in the UK, so it's like uh, household cleaning products. Uh, the, the biggest uh, um, weight is the plastic and the water. So they don't ship you the plastic and the water anymore. They just ship you the concentrates. So that because you have water in your home and you can mix it, so it saves a lot of plastic packaging coming into your house, and also carbon footprint because there's less weight being 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 shipped. But then, for all these uh, startups to uh, to become successful, you know, uh, we will have to they need our help because without the market demand, they will all disappear. Uh, uh, you know, um, you know, under the big huge pressure of the you know, gigantic corporations like Unilever, Danone, and stuff like that. So uh, we will have to like buy their products. You know, and they have a lot of crowdfunding campaigns, fund them, give them feedback, so that uh, they can you know they can scale up and take on these big corporations. So I'm asking people to you know help out whenever you know about any of these startups that you believe that uh, can be good in the long run. Uh, it's always good to good to support them. Otherwise, uh, you know it will be too late before we can make any changes. So no one is coming to save us, basically. So. So I've been doing all this stuff, and I'm frustrated myself because I would like to find solutions. Cycling on the water is a very good uh, conversation starter, very good awareness. I'm done with, uh, like, I'm not done, but raising awareness is not a solution, you know? Talking about bad news is not the one uh, I would like to do. So we're trying to find solutions. So uh, I'm organizing um, a hackathon, uh, the British first plastic hackathon, in, uh, maybe in, uh, in November first week. Uh, that's where I'm going to bring in people, uh, 15 year olds, who can come and share with everyone the vision of the future. And then 55 plus year olds who can bring uh, to the table uh, the business models uh, without plastic that we have lost in those so many years of getting addicted to plastic. And in between, I'm going to bring in product designers, marketing experts, financial engineering, fi like from, uh, and, and investors, uh, and then uh, guys from the British Plastic Federation, 
uh, recycling guides, so that we can go and brainstorm and find some uh, business models, for-profit business models. Because if there's no for-profit, you know, I'm not here uh, to do uh, any kind of sustainability uh, uh, mini project for a corporation. We need to come up with for-profit solutions, and that's what we're trying to achieve and get there uh, in the hackathon. This is going to happen maybe in uh, November. I'm looking for uh, you know, trying putting everything together, and uh, I hope the hackathon will have some tangible outputs that we can we can use, and people can take it forward as well. So we are planning to put some money as well, like 20 grand for people if they want to take it forward. Uh, I got some few impact investors uh, just to help out. So I don't know, I'm trying to find solutions. And it's just an initial uh, stage because otherwise, you know, we can always keep on talking about the bad news, about the new report coming up that uh, plastic is releasing methane, for example. I mean, it's always bad news. And many bad news are going to come out. But we have to, we are all smart people. You know, we can all solve it. We don't have to rely on a lot of policy changes. We, we need them, but we can also try to find our way. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? I'm more than happy to answer. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, the only question I'm going to ask is the bike. Is that your means of publicity? Uh, the bike? Yeah, bike. So initially, uh, when I started the project, bike was made of bamboo. I thought I'm just going to cycle on the river and collect plastic and raise awareness about plastic. But now it has become like a tool to engage with people, and that is where the PR media is interested in. Right? That's basically what I meant. Yeah. 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 Now, yeah. That's what it does. Yeah. That's what it does, yeah. But behind the scenes, I work with uh, councils, councillors. Uh, I've been working with uh, Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Life to help them go plastic free and other events to help them go plastic free mm -hmm. because I really want to make it. But uh, this was never the, the initial goal. The initial goal for me was to cycle on the, on the river and collect plastic and raise awareness. But now, uh, now it has grown. The project has grown into much more bigger. So I got there recently. Oh, I was on CNN. I was on NBC News last week. I have around 25 million views in CNN. So what it means is that I have people from Thailand, from uh, from Indonesia, from Brazil, from from South Africa, from Ivory Coast, who like to use the bike as a tool because they're trying to uh, talk about the, the problems in the river. The government, no one cares. The media doesn't care. They're coming with the canoes. No one cares. They can we use the bike and do something on our own river? And I'm trying to help people around the world to use the bike because everyone else is interested. The media is interested, and, and, and it's a great, great conversation starter. Yeah. I was in the coffee bar the other day, and there was something we used to pubs. Eight pounds a Yeah. Isn't all this about money? And I've been to some of these third world countries. Yeah. And they, they seem to just dispose of everything plastic. Yeah. In ditches, in streets. Yeah. Um, it's about money. It's not about plastic. Well, uh, so that's uh, it, it's it's very complex. So uh, I'll, I'll answer the first one. Eight pounds, yeah. So eight pounds. Uh, the first thing is uh, because there's so much awareness about plastic, and people do not like plastic. There are a lot of new businesses coming up to solve the problem, to find you more alternative, making new products. The the thing here is we do not need to get my own plastic uh, cup. You know, when I can sit in the coffee shop and and drink my coffee. Uh, again, because all these new cups, like a lot of bamboo cup, uh, bamboo products coming up as well, bamboo straws. The thing is, we don't need all this stuff. We have to. People, there's no opportunity yet, but people are making money out of it. But we have to stop it. Yeah, unless you don't have to buy a cup because you, because you want to buy a cup, you don't have to. But eight pounds is is, is, is expensive. Yeah, I mean, that's actually not even the most expensive cup you're talking about. There are like all sorts of opportunities. I mean, so a lot of opportunities are coming up now. A lot of brands, for example. Uh, uh, there's a brand, Masto, I'm sure uh, most of you know, who make uh, sailing gear uh, and other outdoor gear. So they're like, oh, we're making our clothes now from recycled plastic bottles. Like, amazing marketing campaign. So Adidas has been making uh, t-shirts now for Real Madrid and Women Days made out of recycled plastic bottles. Amazing. Like, wow, brilliant. The moment I put those t-shirts in the washing machine, it's going back. It's worse. It's worse than a, a new t-shirt. It's worse. Because they are recycled plastic, so it goes straight away. So it's all like greenwashing in like a different level. This is like in a different level. Um, and really, really shameful. The other one is um, Asian countries. So it's very easy to blame Asian countries. Uh, so we all know that the world's most polluted rivers are in Asian countries and China, uh, although Asian countries. So recycling. We know from BBC three weeks ago that two thirds of the products that we think are getting recycled never gets recycled. We also know from January that China has said no thank you for any of those waste. 
So now we know that Asia does not have, uh, they, they have the worst quality universe. We are sending it to China, now we are sending it to Asia because it's demand, I'm just supplying the demand. Asian countries are taking it for sure. We know they don't have the waste management infrastructure there. That's why the rivers are dirty. We, we don't have them here, that's why we're sending it there. Now what they're gonna do? They're gonna put them in the landfill or in the river. From the river it leaks directly to the ocean, from the ocean back here. So that's the problem. So, we, so the, the real solution to this problem is innovation in the, in the UK where uh, DEFRA and Michael Gove can actually help the recycling companies to innovate and, and make it stronger and have a real waste management system if that is required. Or, and, and not only that, also there needs to be a market for recycled products uh, in, in, the, in the UK. Otherwise, these things will never be solved. The, uh, the what I believe in, the day we stop exporting the waste, we would have solved more problems because that day we have less waste, we don't export it to countries, or we have dealt with it here, you know, or we are uh, like, we are, um, we, are, we, are, we, are you know, we have innovated. That's the only day we would have solved the problem. It's very easy to blame uh, all those countries and, uh, and uh, you know, we're selling as well, uh, loads to them, like, they don't have anything there. They don't have any infrastructure. We don't have it here. It has been a big, big, uh, uh, fake, uh, fake uh, recycling for the last so many years. No, is um, is cardboard as detrimental as plastic? Cardboard. So, no, so, cardboard. so it's it's again that's all this uh, like this is the thing. Good thing is you know we are having these conversations now. So like there's plastic bag, paper bag, cardboard, right? There the question here is I think plastic bag is actually more environmentally friendly. Paper, when you compare apple and apple, because uh, um, uh, paper consumes a lot of uh, water, a lot of energy resources to, to, to make. Trees. Trees, uh, oxygen straight away, so <coughs> the, 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 we lose oxygen. Uh, a lot of weight, so a lot of carbon footprint in transportation cost. So a plastic bag, bag has to be used, so a paper bag has to be used at least 100 plus times to have the same environmental footprint as a plastic bag. But then we can have uh, other bags that can be reused a, a, a lot. So I'm not necessarily promoting paper bags because uh, the real environmental footprint of any of these products so far has been completely hidden. So we just don't know what is the real cost. But now because we have these conversations coming in, people are looking into it. What's the whole whole chain of uh, impact? Not just uh, there's an opportunity, you know, and there bam uh, bamboo products are flooding the market. Uh, also, the, for example, I showed you this one, right? The seaweed thing is amazing, really good. I, li I like those guys. But the question here is, what's, what is happening to the seaweed? Uh, how is being uh, cultured? What's happening to the marine life? Uh, where is being cultured? So we all need to go and dig deeper. So these problems are like um, not, not as simple as it looks like. So any new solution coming in the market, we have to be very, very careful to jump and adopt them without. Uh, thinking it through because we have we have done this already with plastic and we do not want any new material to come in looks a very nice short-term solution but in the long term we don't know so yeah I, I, I just can't well, the only reason I said that is because um, you know you go into every supermarket <coughs> and there's, there's all these plastic containers with milk yeah I mean you know people buy them by the droves I mean if a plastic a fat if a box or a plastic the cardboard wasn't as detrimental I was saying, why don't they just package them in <coughs> cardboard containers rather than all the plastic? Check the package. It's it's complex, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a weight issue. It's, it's it's a bit complex. Back in glass, right? You can easily recycle it. Yeah, yeah. Like it used to be. But again, the the, the yeah. So the, 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 the one of the biggest things they use now is that plastic has helped reduce food waste. Uh, there is a like oh, so we have reduced food waste. There's a report that has come out a few few months ago. But actually, maybe not. Because when you put the graphs together, because we use more plastic packaging, it's easy for us now to buy loads of stuff and everything gets wasted. Before you at least uh, you bought what you actually needed, now you're buying more stuff. So when you put the graphs together, actually this is increased food waste. So, but obviously the industry will find all sorts of ways to, to prove, prove their point. Uh, the biggest irony, uh, what I discovered is that I've been reading some lobbying papers from Brussels. Uh, the, the guy who is the president of the British, uh, sorry, of the European Plastic uh, Manufacturers Association? Is the same guy who leads up the, uh, who is the head of the uh, uh, Keep the Europe Tidy campaign. <laughs> so uh, basically, they're trying to move it from the producer responsibility to consumer responsibility, blaming on littering behavior and other things. And there is no recycling to take care. Of whatever you do on the recycling side of things, uh, but. Uh, that, that, that is one of the things. I'm, again, I'm not telling you it, it's bad, but we have to we have to make sure that you know we find a solution. 
uh, last week uh, you know, there's a consultation happening around how taxation can, can solve the problem. There are 162,000 uh, uh, people around the UK who has contributed. I think there's going to be a huge overhaul of the, of the taxation system. And, and the industry is full of, uh, yeah, they need, they need help. That's why the hackathon, because they need help too. They don't know what's going on as well. So I'm just bringing in guys from the uh, Plastic Federation. So because we would like to solve the problem together. Everyone would like to have a good plan, so. Okay. <coughs> Did you speak to the BBC before they got one of their major characters to go plastic free? Or did they come up with the idea on their own? I think they came in on their own, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was mostly, I believe, that uh, uh, the Blue Planet 2 that triggered uh, a lot of things, yeah. I was there just before, and I think I got a lot of momentum myself because of Blue Planet and Two <coughs> with, uh, with uh, Sir David Attenborough. Yeah, but uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not here to fight with anyone or make any comments. But uh, you know, Sky Ocean Rescue is a big, uh, big campaign, as you know. Uh, their uh, their whole team was uh, cheering with plastic uh, champagne uh, uh, glasses <laughs> last time, and they had uh, the whole hashtag pass on plastic and everything else. Like, guys, come on. Well, Rotarians probably don't know about the archers. Yeah. It's only us women who. <laughs> <laughs> All right, if I may just have the last question that uh, I was reading about it or seeing on television as well, that the world produces about 300 million tons of plastic per year. Yeah. Only 9 million gets recycled. Yeah. And 8 million of those get dumped into the ocean. So this is the current status. You see, so I'm sure you're doing a good job. So I invite uh, Ray here to give the vote of thanks, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Excuse me, um, it's all about research and education that I think we've had both here. There's a gentleman here who is not only going around physically cleaning up, but also prepared to look into the system and see what can be done, but also to educate us. Um, thank you, Drew, for the most interesting talk. Thank you. Any other business? Yeah, just to remind everybody that next Thursday is our evening meeting. I know you know, but uh, don't come here lunchtime because you have to buy yourself a meal and be your other stuff. So it's, it's next Thursday evening, and if you do know of anybody else who wants to come, please just give me a Really, well, it doesn't really, really matter. If I want to come, just come along because it's a restaurant, so there'll be plenty of food. So, if you know anybody who'd like a nice Chinese meal next Thursday evening, just uh, bring them along. Or... Thank, you. <laughs> just come along. Thank you, Noel. Anyone else? No one else? Just to say that. The plan for going to Germany is going ahead. Normally we take gifts uh, when we go to Germany. When they come to us, they take gifts for us. Um, we're looking for suggestions in terms of what to take. Maybe we think they've got enough wine, <laughs> yeah. enough, enough fluids. And I suggested to a couple of people last week but maybe we may look at something like souvenir, British souvenir, each at the cost of a bottle of wine. If anyone can think of an idea on how we go about sourcing this, because we don't have much time. And it's actually getting it there, so depending on what we come up with, we'd have to distribute it amongst us in order to transport it to the fine. Every cycling, you can put it on your back. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be mainly driving, so maybe the storage of it, getting over there, isn't, may not be a problem. So. Okay. <coughs> Where's your cycling? Maybe not. Given up on cycling. If anybody has yeah. any, if anyone has any, and then we just. They'll take it to the club council and then if you have any suggestions. Okay, well, Thank we just you. have to enjoy it in club councils and then just start and finalize. Okay, anyone else? No. Okay, then, so let me just uh, remind you of the college's book and the website for your menus for next or uh, no menus because <coughs> you're eating Chinese, so you don't need to look at the menus next week. Okay, so please be upstanding for the final tour.
Lord, and peace for the world. For the world.